Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is Wednesday. It is the 7th. No, it's not. It's the 6th of March, and we are here for another Met Bull update. I want to briefly just explain what the Met Bull is and why we're being updated so regularly. The Met Bull stands for the Meteorological Bulletin Database. It's an online database of all approved meteorites. This is like the Bible for us. If the meteorite's not there, we don't really put a whole lot of faith in it being a meteorite. So that is where the database of all classified meteorites by scientists is kept. And it's regularly um, updated. And Sue is going to give us the, this is her little baby. She did all this by herself, but she's going to uh, show us the updates for January and February of 2024. So Sue, it's in your hands. All right. Thanks, Topher. Um, yeah, just like Topher said, the numbers that we are going to uh, review today are things that were approved and published in January and February of this year. So not necessarily found or witnessed, you know, fall of this year. It's just the things that finally made it through the classification process and hit the database um, this year to date. Um, ending on February 29th. All right, we have 494 meteorites to cover, so let's get going. I wanted to talk to you guys about the goals I have for the Metbull update. I changed things up a little bit last time and wanted to um, refocus how I'm doing these. And um, one of the things that I wanted to work on was um, to inspire like amateur hunters to start studying and using the Metbull. Because what? Because when I talk to new hunters, I'm always surprised that they don't even know what the Met Bull is. They don't know how many meteorites were really found in their area. Um, so, you know, I encourage people to start reading the write-ups. You're going to start seeing trends when you do this. You're going to see the kind of terrains uh, that you should be searching. You're going to start, if you read the write-ups, you're going to see the geological features to focus on. Um, you're going to learn where the closest dense collection areas are in your area. Um, or, where, you know, if you have to dry or fly to them, um, you're going to learn the areas to stop searching in and, and wasting your effort. So my goal is to just kind of share insights with you guys to make you uh, approach hunting differently if you haven't been successful yet. So moving on to Antarctica. So Antarctica, every meteorite found there is classified as its own classification. So we only had 26 meteorites uh, classified in Antarctica through the year. And... Um, the 26 meteorites were found by the Lost Meteorites of Antarctica Project. And you guys probably know that better as Lost Mets UK. And this is the first UK-led uh, meteorite recovery expedition from uh, Great Britain. The project um, has successfully confirmed two high-density areas, and you guys are probably familiar with these names. Um, the one with the one meteorite is uh, the Hutchinson Ice Field, and the, the one with 25 is the Outer Recovery Ice Fields. Um, they've also been... Um, investigating a few of uh, three other previously um, unvisited Antarctic Nunatox, and those are Turner, Pillinger, and Halliday. And there aren't any meteorites with those names yet, but don't be surprised if, we, if you see something with one of those names in the future. On the next slide, you'll see the classifications that uh, Lost Met has found this year. Um, you know, there's a mesosiderite and a, a carbonaceous, uh, but the rest are just ordinary chondrites. Um, so moving on, um, I just mentioned Nunatak, and that is the Inuit word for lonely mountain. So um, this word, this is actually essentially a hill or a mountain that's completely surrounded by glacial ice. Um, they also call them glacial islands, and they're essentially exposed portions of the ridges, mountains, or peaks that are not covered in ice or snow, um, or like they're at the edge of an ice field or a glacier. And from what I understand, these are excellent places to search for meteorites in the Antarctica. So on the next slide, um, you'll see that um, the UK, the Lost Mets UK undertook a meteorite uh, searching um, on the ice surface with a skidoo. Um, they de developed a pulse induction system um, to search for meteorites trapped within the first meter, meter of uh, ice. And so they're searching on these blue ice fields. Um, this is just a bird's eye view of the schematic of the full metal detector panel. And um, I'll provide a picture in the comments um, on the video when we post that. Um, and then um, here you can see that's the um, full detection system that's deployed at a place called Sky Blue. And then on the last slide, um, this is the detection system uh, deployed at, at the outer recovery ice fields where they find a lot of their meteorites. 
And um, the night before they did this, um, one to two centimeters of uh, snow had fallen. And that meant good news and bad news. Um, the bad news was that they couldn't spot meteorites with their eyes, like on the surface. But the good news is that um, the snow was really useful with the skidoo because they could see where they've actually dragged the, the uh, panel system already from the tracks in the, in the snow. So um, all the meteorites that they found so far are curated at the Natural History uh, Museum in London, and they are available for a scientific analysis. So that is the Antarctic update. Um, and now we are going to move on to confirmed falls. Uh, last time we had confirmed falls, um, probable falls, um, finds, possible falls. This time we don't have any of those. We just have, I think, five or six confirmed falls. So, yep, five. There were five uh, approved so far, and I have them, I believe, in order of when they were published. And um, the first one that uh, was witnessed this year was a uh, Shidian, and that is a carbonaceous uh, meteorite that fell in the Yunnan uh, province of China. And um, it's there were a few villagers, I think eight local villagers saw it fall, and then one person went and recovered the stones, and they fell about one kilometer apart. Um, they are partly covered with a black fusion crust, and the interior is uh, black with uh, abundant white dots. And to me, that sounded like TARDA a little bit. Um, they're not the same exact uh, classification, but pretty close. Um, so then the second of the witness falls is Elmshorn. Um, this is an H36 chondrite that fell in Germany last April, and it was uh, recorded by two uh, meteor cameras of the All Sky 7 network. And um, how lucky is this person? Um, a main mass of like almost 3,800 grams fell in someone's garden, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I know sure. Topher wishes this would fall. Something like that would fall in his backyard, even if it damaged our pool deck or something. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the next one uh, is uh, Copra Go Goav. Um, it ends with an N, but I looked it up and you pronounce it um, as a V, Copar Goav. Um, it's an LL5 that fell in January um, of 2023. And it, I thought this was really cool that it was witnessed by several people, including someone doing their morning yoga routine on the bank of the Godavari River. And I'm like, that's like, it sounds a little cliche, but it, it's exactly what I would uh, expect from a meteor, a witness meteorite fall in India. Everyone's doing yoga and stuff. I'm like, that's so cool. So before we move to the next section, raise your electronic hand if you happen to know there's something that Copra Goav and Elmshorn have in common. Does anybody know? If you do, raise your electronic hand. Otherwise, I'll just tell you guys. And I will say if you're a Patreon member um, and you've been paying attention to my post, then you've probably educated on this fact already. All right. I don't see any electronic hands up, so I will say... Both of these meteorites um, damaged roof tiles uh, when they fell. So I thought that was kind of a cool fact. So I'm going to turn it over. <laughs> Hammerstones, yes. And so speaking of Hammerstones, I'm going to turn it over to Topher for show and tell. You did all the telling. I'm just going to do the showing. So I actually mm -hmm. have a small sample of that LL5 um, Capergon, Capergon. I can't say it like you, baby, but there, there you have it. There's a, a quarter gram of the of the total known weight of only a kilo. So what's interesting about this is obviously you can see we just said it went through a roof. Well, there is part of the metal roof. So I am very fortunate to have uh, a quarter gram of it. Of the total known weight of only a thousand grams, a witness fall with a hammer event. In so, India. <laughs> yes. And yes, you can actually tell it's a meteorite. It's big enough. It's a quarter gram. <laughs> Sue, back to you. <laughs> okay. So the next, yes, the next um, fall was in um, Italy, in Basilicata, Italy. Um, it was called Matera. Uh, not too much of a story on this one, but I thought what was really cool is that it fell on Valentine's Day in 2023, and then it was approved and published on Valentine's Day in 2024. So I'm wondering if someone planned that on purpose. I'm not sure, but I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> so since we're talking about an Italian witness fall, I wanted to revisit Renazzo that we discussed um, last time we had a Maple update. We had um, our newest international crew member, Thomas Mazzi, um, sent us a video and talked about Renazzo. And now he is the person that 
is uh, in the Met Bull and is responsible for reclassifying a 200-year-old meteorite, um, reclassifying the, the location based on old manuscripts and notes that from the 1800s, which I thought was amazing. So um, he was nice enough to send us a video and talk about it. And it was a few weeks away, but he was talking about the um, Renato Bicentennial celebration. So this wasn't like a kegger type of party, but it was a... Um, a weekend party of education. And as you can see, this is the poster. Um, I obtained all these pictures from the Associazoni um, Astrophili Senta Sientes uh, Facebook page. It's all in Italian. Um, if you know a little bit Italian or Spanish or can use Google Translate, you can figure out a lot of it. So it looks like there were a lot of students involved. There were like uh, musical presentations. Um, there were uh, a lot of guest speakers, um, displays, interactive educational, um, you know, activities for people visiting the center. And uh, like I said, it looked like there were a lot of young people involved. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and uh, thank you to Thomas for uh, bringing, you know, the pictures and just the events of that weekend to my attention. Um and then um, what, another fun fact that I found out about Renato is that, I'm trying to remember his name, um, Gian, I forget his first name, but um, Lamborghini is his last name. Uh -huh. <laughs> you may have heard of him. And he actually uh, lives in, or lived, came from Renato, Italy. So that's another claim to fame for Renato. Um, so of the last of these pictures, um, I'm not sure if um, the artwork was just done for the Bicentennial or if this was something that um, was just created, but it's a postcard, a Renatso postcard. And then if you go to the next slide, you'll see on the back is a Renatso, looks like a commemorative stamp. So I, I'm going to try to talk Thomas into sending me a postcard just oh. like that. I thought that would be kind of cool. So um, yeah, thank you, uh, Thomas. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Very cool to have that feet on the street there in Italy. All right. So our next, uh, I think the last witness fall um, was in um, Germany. Yes. And this one we, we've featured on the show before, but this piece right here is super, super special. This, I cannot believe it fell in 2024 and has already been classified and published in 2024. This is... 2024 BX1, when it was in space. Then we, not we, but smarter men than me, uh, forecasted exactly when it would enter the German sky and it fell, it was collected. So this is Riddick. This is a witnessed Albright. And I'm really super happy that this piece was brought to us at the Meteorite Mansion from Roberto Vargas. And uh, it is the, the first piece of Riddick to be brought from Europe to America. And we had it at the Meteorite Mansion that night. So thank you, uh, Roberto Vargas, for allowing us to photograph this and share in, in the experience. I also want to thank um, Theo. Theo Leo, Leo, Leo Than. Leo Than. Sorry, I put them both together. Uh, Leo <laughs> Than actually sent me a piece of Riddick. You can see it right there in the center. And these are, these are pictures of the Riddick that he found. He's a viewer of our show in Germany. And when he was watching uh, me in Tucson talk about the fall, he got enthusiastic, went out and found a piece. And lo and behold, sent a piece to me. And you can actually see the glossy, uh, not glossy, the absolutely clear fusion crust uh, in my sample as well. But I really want to show my appreciation uh, to you, Leo, because that is something uh, really super special for you to do for me. And I tried to take as best pictures as I could without my microscope being set up, but you can definitely see the bubbles in the fusion crust, super, super weird, absolutely clear fusion crust. You can see it right there. So this fell in Germany just less than a month ago or a month and a half ago. Super awesome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Back to you, Sue. Right. Now we're going to go over reclassifications. There were a lot of them. We're not going to dive into everything. Um, but on the next slide, um, 
these are the reclassifications we've had this um, year so far, the, more of the basic ones like updates to total known weight, location, the year it was found, uh, things of that nature. There was a name correction, um, NWA 16399 was changed to an NEA. I looked into this and I discovered that the location was uh, listed originally as Northwest Africa. And then it was updated to Libya, and Libya is on the eastern side of North Africa. So um, there are uh, about 1,550 meteorites classified in Libya. Most of them are found in uh, really well-known stone fields, such as, or not stone fields, dense collection areas, such as uh, Dar al-Ghani, um, Daraj, Hamada al-Hamra, and um, 47, uh, there's 47 NEAs altogether, and 40 of them are in Libya. So... On the next slide, um, we're going to see the actual classifications where they updated the meteorite classification. And I, I don't obviously have time to go into each one of them, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the second one listed there, the one that was changed from a Howardite to a Howardite belt brescia. And the reason I just chose to jump into this one is because um, I was speaking to Jason Whitcomb and he was able to give me a lot more details than what I, I was able to find in uh, the MEPL. So um, the uh, NWA 14585 uh, was originally classified as a Howardite and then it was reclassified obviously as the Howardite Mount Brescia. Um, Back in the day, Jason had um, sent the Howardite um, to Dr. Irvine to classify, and he talked about it being a Howardite Mount Brescia, but there was not a classification for that one yet, so he just submitted it as a Howardite to, to push it through. And then a few months later, um, Dr. Um, Grish, I'm not sure how to say his name, Grishake, uh, submitted um, the meteorite classification Howardite Melt Brescia and got it approved as a new classification. And um, when uh, he brought this up to Paul Sibieria, um, who was working alongside Dr. Irving, um, he mentioned it to Tony, who then sent a note to the committee stating that um, he should re they should reclassify 14585 as a Howardite Melt Brescia. Jason was really happy that he went the extra mile and took care of that. So um, he had originally gotten two stones from this find, um, but the hunters went out and they actually found more. So Jason got these samples to Paul Sibiera and to look at them, to add these to the original main mass. And um, this was in mid classification of the, um, for the material. And Paul said, there's a lot going on and um, suggested that uh, let's look more closely at these stones because um, there's a wide representation of different kind of material here. So he actually pulled a Eucrite out of, um, you know, all this Howardite stuff. And then he also thinks there's a diagonite in there that's going to be classified. So now Paul is uh, diligently like going through everything and doing more work and um, on the additional material and suggested that Jason submit for a new name and number uh, with the new analysis. So he seems really interested because the material just has a lot of cool stuff going on. So even though it was, um, you know, originally a Howardite, it's been updated to the um, Howardite Melt Brescia. Um, there are two other uh, meteorites that pulled that were pulled from that lot and they've been um that have been published and some of the material still with uh paul and tony and um there might be another set of material coming up because they're spending more time analyzing it and um we'll we'll, we'll kind of wait and for an update uh because it sounds like uh there's gonna be more interesting stuff uh, maybe another classification so we'll uh we'll wait to hear back from jason on that <laughs> super interesting looking stuff well, yeah, Jason. Thank you, babe. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to go into locations. My favorite, since I'm a geography nerd. All right. So these are all the USA finds, um, Texas, Arizona, and then two in Nevada. Um, La Mesa uh, is the one in Texas, and that's an, L, an H4 chondrite. And it was found in 1985 by Mr. Buford Sanders in his cotton field. Um, he found it in a furrow um, after a hard rain the night before um, on his farm. I actually had to look up what a furrow was because I wasn't familiar with that term, even though I grew up in, for a lot of my childhood in Arizona, dry farmland that needed irrigation systems. We use the term berm a lot, but that's the top, the you know, the part of the top. The part that's the depression, the groove, that's what the furrow is. And apparently um, in farmland, that's a good place to search for meteorites. So at any rate, um, 
uh, the farmer used this as a bookend on his mantelpiece from 1985 to uh, 2005 until he ended up selling it. And then the person that bought it submitted it for classification years later. So that's the story behind La Mesa. I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> And then moving to Nevada, we have two meteorites found in the Stewart Valley um, uh, dense collection area. Um, they were found by Anton Clemens and Bob Barish. And now there are 26 meteorites in total uh, being listed um, in this dense col uh, collection area that have been found from 2001 to 2022. And on the next slide, I showed like here are the classification. So, you know, AHLs and LLs. So next one is uh, the Wilcox Playa, which is in Arizona. And um, inter I'm going to just give a little bit of information that we're going to turn it over to the actual finder. Um, but the first one, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that the first one was found in 1979. And then there wasn't one found again until 2001 by uh, Bob Birish of Meteorite Recovery Lab. Uh, looks like Bob was having all the fun through most of the 2000s. And then uh, Ruben Garcia and Jason Utahs got in on the action. Um, and I thought was a really fun fact about Jason. He was the finder, the main mass holder, and the classifier of his meteorite. So I wonder how often that actually happens. But um, nine years passed without any more finds. And then Chris McDonnell found one. And now he's the only person on this list that wasn't actually out looking for meteorites. He was looking for an old aircraft crash site. And if you go to the Met Bull, they have like the um, field ID number, we don't, we know about meteorites here, not um, crash sites, but it looks like, uh, I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole, but it looks like an interesting story. So a few more years uh, passed and then um, Eric Rasmussen found one and we have Eric actually with us right now. And so we're going to turn it over to Eric with conversations with hunters and have Eric tell us a little bit more about uh, Wilcox Playa 012. Hey everybody. Hey uh, Eric. I was uh, in a, height of the COVID panic, I was bored to death. So I decided to take a drive out to Wilcox Playa again. I'd been out there several times. And uh, Wilcox Playa is a tough dry lake to hunt because it was a uh, World War II uh, Army Air Force training ground. So there's 50 caliber bullets everywhere that from a distance look the same color as a meteorite. So uh, I spent about uh, six miles of walking out there, driving around my truck, and uh, right in the middle of the day, I came across a meteorite. Wow. This, uh, when I was hunting, I uh, parked my truck, and then I walk about a mile circle around my truck, and I was heading back to the truck, and that was uh, when I saw it. I was that close to my truck when I saw it. Oh, wow. That's after I, I picked it up. Wow, total moon gram, 18 grams, huh? <laughs> yeah, funny. yeah. And a, a year prior, I'd found uh, uh, the one I showed you when we met at ASU, Topher. That was, I found one other one there on that dry lake. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. So this time, how many miles did it take you to to find that one? I was about halfway into the day, so I was probably three or four miles. Nice, but you kept going, right? Oh yeah. Nice, that's that's what retirement's for. Uh, man, thank you so much. Uh, next time you uh, you have the, it in your gumption to drive out there, give me a little ring, drop me a note. Let me see what I'm in, in the mood to do. I would love to find my uh, a first Flyer meteorite with you, man. Well, if you can't find a meteorite, you can find lots of uh, 50 cal bullets, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, having another successful hunter on the show. It means a lot to us, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. All right, moving on to the European published meteorites. Uh, we're not going to go deeply into these because we actually covered these already. This is a Elmshorn, Ribic, and Matera. So we're just going to jump right into the Chinese spines. Chinese? Oh, I'm sorry. South American. <laughs> <laughs> I skipped a whole page. <laughs> okay. Hey, we Erica back in here to help find our way. <laughs> All right. So um, we have 192 down in, where do you think? Antofagasta, Chile. 
Um, and as you can guess, they were all found in well-established uh, dense collection areas. So no big surprise there. We always see a lot of meteorites coming out of this area. So moving on, to, now moving on to China. Yes. So yes, Nei Mongol or known as Inner Mongolia. This is, um, we had, we looked at uh, a little bit deeper into the terrain last time. Um, this is the an autonomous region of Northern China. And as you can see, I, well, I put the, the, the name over the area, but um, it's kind of highlighted in red there. There's some up in the north part, it looks like some, you know, wetter green terrain. And then obviously there's desert. So um, they have a lot of green stuff. They have arid desert. Um, they have lengthy sections of the um, Great Wall of China here. There's uh, thousands of acres of grasslands. Um, and um, so they, they have 30 uh, meteorites so far here, two recently found. And out of the 30, there are five witness falls. Um, so the next section in China is uh, Xinjiang, and this is where uh, most of the meteorites, I think, um, that are found in China are found here. Um, this is another autonomous territory in China, and it has just vast um, regions of um, deserts and mountains. So um, all the meteorites found in this region were found in a multitude of different uh, dense collection areas. They all have low numbers, so um, even... the of 344 of the like 513 meteorites found in China come from these dense collection areas. And like I said, because they have low numbers so far, I expect that we'll start seeing a lot more, um, you know, in the future. So, and out of all of these 344, only one was a witness fall. And obviously, because it looks like it's out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And so um, Yunnan, as you can see, is in a different type of terrain in China. And um, I believe there were five meteorites found altogether, um, one just this year. And of the five, I think four of them were witness falls. And now this one is a witness fall. We, we covered earlier, it's a Shidian. And um, as you can see, it has, there's a lot of like uh, mountains and um, they said rice terraces, lakes, uh, deep gorges. Uh, so a little bit different terrain. And so it's not surprising that um, most of them have been witnessed falls. So the next place we're going is to the Middle East. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so this is in Yezkazgan, uh, Kazakhstan. So um, there's only been 25 meteorites found. And now look at the terrain. So I think there's a lot more meteorites out there in Kazakhstan. Um, seven of them have been witness falls, but, um, yeah, I'm not, you know, there's sometimes there's political reasons, um, or just maybe there's not a lot of people searching in that area, but I bet you there's a lot more meteorites out there. So, and then, uh, still in the Middle East, we found, we had four in Iran. Um, Iran has had, um, they've had 384 meteorites found, uh, six witness falls altogether. Uh, most of the meteorites found in Iran have been found in Kerman. Uh, there weren't any found there this time, but they were. There were two found in Sistan and Baluchistan province, and then um, one in Yazd, and um, that is one of twelve. Um, uh, and they're mainly from two dense collection areas there. And then really close to Yazd um, is Khorasan, and uh, there was one found there, and that is um, they have fifteen in total. Um, there's a witness fall, and they're mostly from dense collection areas there as well. So um, the next place, oh, and we are uh, by Mike Kelly. <laughs> um, we have <laughs> one witness fall in India. We covered that one earlier. That one was the um, uh, Kopa Gorov. And um, that was the one that we showed with the uh, roof tile and the, the hammerstone. So um, moving on to Northwest Africa. So we had 140 found in Northwest and then two in the Northeast. And then on this next one, this is uh, the um, specific countries. We got Morocco coming in hot with 34. And um, on the next slide, I uh, wanted to show you before we jump into, um, we're going out of the, the current numbers and going to the total numbers. So Northwest Africa has 12,571 meteorites uh, found so far. Northeast Africa has 47. We have the Sahara um, Desert, um, and that was a 1,037. Um, and uh, those numbers, I believe, were um, 
the Sahara was used from like 1997 to like 2003. And then we moved to, I think the NWA um, nomenclature. So um, this, I spent some time on this slide. And so I wanted to show, this is the, like kind of what I wanted to show like the amateur hunters. Um, as you can see where we have the really dry desert terrain, you can see like the total numbers. Now each number um, box has the um, on the right is the total number of meteorites found, and then the number on the left is how many were witness falls. So the drier the region, you see that the percentage of witness falls are a lot lower, but there's a lot more meteorites found. And as you go lower toward the equator, there's less meteorites found, as you can see over on the um, like down in the southern region, there's a lot of countries that have no meteorites. Um, and a lot of those will that do have them, there's a high percentage of witness falls. So even in a place that is right, you know, bordering the most one of the most meteorite dense um, regions on the planet, um, if you're in the wrong terrain, you're not going to find as many meteorites. You're going to be competing when there's a witness fall. So, you know, when we hear from people in Florida, they're convinced that they found 30 meteorites, like, you know, down by the beach, like, you, you really have to start looking at this with, you know, through different eyes and, and, you know, really see the real numbers here. Um, I mean, there's places right next to, you know, countries that have a thousand meteorites and they have none because the whole terrain changed. So as you can see, as you go more south into Africa, um, the numbers change and obviously down near, you know, Namibia and uh, South Africa, that changes a little bit because it's a little bit drier down there. So um, we're going to jump in uh, to, and I wanted to point out that um, Swaziland um, is down um, on the right hand co corner is uh, one of one that is now a new country that's Eswatini and um, we're going to discuss Namibia a little bit more on, a, on another slide, but I wanted to test everyone. So Botswana has 12 meteorites. One of them was a witness fall, and nine of them are from a dense collection area. Now, I want to ask um, if you know, raise your electronic hand, if you know what the witness fall was in Botswana. Does anybody know? We've mentioned this on several hangouts. And I'm very disappointed. <laughs> Topher, tell them what I, the witness fall was in Botswana. I, I forget the name of it. It's like three syllables. It's a witnessed one. It's a Howardite. It fell on my birthday, June 2nd. Mopa something. Matopi Pond. Matopi Pond, yeah. There yes, you go. we've talked about this one a few times. I'm not going to give everyone a hard time since you didn't remember the name. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, Namibia. So Swakam Swakamund, Namibia is. It looks like it's um, a new uh, strewn or uh, not strewn field, dense collection area. And um, as you can see on the next slide, um, the name is Meribib, and there are um, twenty. Um, it's through zero to one on the classification so far. So. Um, just ordinary chondrites, but um, I think we'll start. We'll still see some more um, classifications coming out of Namibia in the future. So now we're going to move on to now we're done with locations. We're going to move on to classifications. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to go over chondrites first. So um, on the next slide, we have the chondrite numbers. There weren't too many rare, but we did have one um, primitive ungrouped chondrite, which there's only one of seven. Um, but the crew and friends of the crew came in strong with uralites this time around and a very special braconite. So the first uralite is um, Chris Monks. And we're going to turn it over to Chris for show and tell. Hey, bud. How are you, man? Good. How are you guys? Fantastic. <clears throat> So I don't have a tremendous amount to disclose about this rock other than it is like most urolites, super hard and wears the saws out. I usually, if I have a suspect urolite or an actual urolite, I test it on an old saw blade because I want to see how much damage it's going to do before I wreck a brand new expensive saw blade. But this one was a cool one. I bought this as a achondrite, but an unknown type. And I could see some green crystals poking through the oh, surface yeah. in the pictures. So I was really hopeful. Once I cut it, I knew 100% it was a Uralite. <laughs> um, I took about three slices, 
to get the classification. And you could see that I haven't polished it yet. And that big giant chunk is still in a big giant chunk. <laughs> uh, now I might try it out on the wire saw to see if it does a little bit better, but it is um, very hard, very hard. A little bit remnant fusion crust on there. Yeah. And it's got some some large green crystals in it. Yeah, right up in there, really in, up in here too. Wow, super interesting, man. And classified by Daniel. Huh. Yep. Yeah. Let me know when you're done polishing that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I haven't polished it yet because the last time I polished a Uralite, it ruined all my polishing yeah. equipment and I had to buy new stuff. So <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Man. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it, buddy. Yes, sir. Now we're going to jump in to um, Yang Shenchung's Uralite. That's Yang of SR Meteorites. And uh, he had NWA 16240 um, approved and published. And Topher, I'm going to ask you for a little bit of help on these pictures, um, help describe what we're seeing and what some of the cool features are. Okay. I hope I can help. I know you can. <laughs> it looks like we're looking at a thin section right there, probably from uh, Anthony Love, the doctor who classified the meteorite. But here, here exactly what was shown in Chris's Uralite is shown in this Uralite here with these crystal structure. Um, so that's very, very Uralitic. And we do see some uh, fusion crust here. I wonder how many slices of this will be. Wow, look at that. Wow, that's super interesting. Um, one thing to look at uh, uh, on Uralites is triple junctions. So like here's here's one right here with a Y. You see that Y? That's a, right there is a triple junction. And you'll see that repeated throughout the, uh, the structure of a Uralite. So the external crystals that Chris talked about, and uh, if you ever do get a cut and you see that on the inside, um, more, more uh, interesting fusion crust. Wow. Yeah, these things are absolutely super dense. And um, that's why when you when you get a slice of Uralite, man, you're going to pay a little extra because you're probably buying a saw blade for the guy too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back to you, Sue. Yeah, and thank you to Yang for sending these pictures to us. Um, He's not been feeling well, so I hope he gets better soon. Um, but he and um, was just celebrating his daughter's second birthday, Catalina, yeah. and she's so adorable. So Hi, Yang Catalina. is. We just we we really like we just love Yang. He just yeah. he sends us so many gifts and so many cool and just intriguing things for the crew to look at, and um, we just really appreciate our our little partnership that we have with him. He's awesome. Thanks, so Yang. yeah, moving on to H E D. So. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, not HED yet. I'm oh. sorry. We have an angrite, and this angrite is actually really interesting. So this is uh, Fazu002, and I believe this is the largest or second largest angrite ever found. And so um, here's a picture of it that Mark Lyon sent over to me. And um, I am going to read a little bit off the paper for the next slide because... It's an uh, oxygen isotope chart, <laughs> and I want to make sure I get everything right. So um, before we um, before we jump in deep into the chart, I just want to review a few basic facts that I pulled from the MEPL about angrites. So um, angrites are olive um, olivine bearing uh, basaltic meteorites that um, originate from a volatile depleted uh, planetesimal, and um, the uh, petrologic studies um, indicate that angrites experience little physical or chemical alteration after crystallizing. So consequently, angrites are the oldest rocks known as ig igneous rocks, and um, they kind of in a way preserve the records of the early solar system uh, chronology and um, tell us about uh, planetary formation, uh, melting and differentiation. So, um, sorry, that was a mouthful. No, um, so yeah, this um, now marks Angrite. Now, if you move to the next uh, slide, um, you'll see now, see where the red X's are. These, um, this shows kind of why it's um, a more rare Angrite. It's not plotting where the other Angrites are plotting. Um, 
And so um, this is a really rare, unique one. Um, it has very, a very unique brown fusion crust. And so the specimen that was uh, submitted for classification is an aggregate of uh, interlocking um, anhedral grains exhibiting allotriomorphic granular texture. And that um, texture is what makes it unique and makes it why it plots on the chart that way that it does. So um, this one is, like I said, it's unique and there was a lot of it found. So congratulations to Mark on a really cool classification. Yeah, that, that is super neat. Uh, I will just give a brief little demonstration, if you don't mind, babe, of this. Yeah. If we're looking at these triangles right here, these triangles represent the angrites. So angrites that have been tested have plotted here. And you can see it has like a median line. And that's just a visual aid for us. His angrite Fazu002 plotted over here. So it's little, it's it, it has different chemistry and uh, oxygen isotope relation between oxygen 18 and oxygen 17. And that's kind of what we're looking at on this chart. Thanks, Topher. Now we can move to HED meteorites. Uh -huh. So um, HED, um, most of the people in this group know that HED stands for Howardite, Eucrite, and Diagenite, and those come from Four Vesta. So the picture that you're seeing here is a picture on the very left is Four Vesta, and then we have Ceres, and then we have our moon. And um, Four Vesta is actually, I think it's like the second or third largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. Third largest. Um, so that's where the HED meteorites come from. So with HED, uh, the crew came in really strong with Eucrite. So, so we're going to go back to our buddy Monkman, and he is going to talk to us about NWA 16345. All right. So this is this is another one. I have a couple of pursuits, and I, I don't know why I'm fascinated by HEDs, but I am. So we have different, um, you have the Howardites, Eucrites, the Agenites, my goal is to get one of each at least, but in the pursuit of some, you often find others. So I thought this was a Howardite when I first got it. It had a really weird yellowish desert varnish on it. No visible fusion crust that I could see, but it just had a really unique look to it. Um, when I cut it open and looking at it, it had that very differentiated um, composite like in different materials all compiled together like sandstone and you can kind of see it right there yeah. in, in the outside um, so there was originally he had several stones I mean you know you could see over there in the white and black kind of there's like a separate rock that's embedded in there that to me is very eucritic um, mm -hmm. but you look yeah. at the the whole picture of it and it looks very mm -hmm. Howard ish Mm -hmm. um so i i ended up getting uh one of the the bigger of the two rocks that he had and um cut it up was like yeah this this is good bought the other one um compared it i kept the smaller one for the main mass this was the bigger of the two rocks that i sliced up and it just inevitably it turned out to be a polymic eucrite which is and maybe somebody else can explain this better to me, but polymic is a bunch of different stuff jumbled together to make one type. A monomic would be all of the same type of material conglomerated together. So wow. no one needs to fix that. That was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, and and if you look at Howardites, Howardites are kind of a polymic breccia. Um, and the, the differences between Eucrite and Howardite are very small. Um, you could just a little bit more of one type of material, it could turn into a Howardite, a little bit less, and it turns into a Eucrite. So, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. classifications are kind of like a sliding scale at some points, but definitely in the HED classes, more like Chris was saying, it's a sliding scale based on the composition. Yes. Percentages. Yeah. And, and a little bit of that also has to do with, um, differentiation. You get, the deeper you get, the more differentiated you get. You're exposed to more heat, more pressure, recrystallization, that kind of stuff. Good job, um, man. Thank I, you. I, I am a pretty, pretty rock guy. I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris Monk. I definitely appreciate it, bud. Yes, sir.
And it's true what you were saying, because that's what um, Jason Whitcomb was telling us earlier about his Howardite, that there was a Ukrite uh, classified from it. They found diagenite material. So yeah, it's like you said, it's a sliding scale. So speaking of Jason, we're going to show um, his Ukrite unbrechiated. Um, and Topher's going to help me with the show and tell for this. But um, this one, it's a small one. It's 72 grams. Uh, there were two stones that um, Jason was offered of this material. And um, he thought it was a diagenite from the exterior. Um, and he was hoping it was not a terrestrial. He was saying with his luck. Um, but he was confident enough to send it in. And he was happy with the results that it came um, out to be a Ukrite. And uh, he said he thinks that this one's going to uh, polish up really well. Topher, any thoughts about this one? Yeah, I, I wouldn't have put it as a Ukraine. Wow. It, it, this is definitely, it's my first time seeing these pictures. I think it's very, very interesting. 78 gram single stone. 72. 72. Yeah, beautiful, man. Like, I'm, it's not like a Ukraine I've seen before. That's fascinating. I, I really don't have anything to add, babe. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. We have, we have another, we have another, um, uh, I think it's a Ukrite uh, from another uh, crew member. Oh, Sean. Like I said, yeah, the uh, the crew was coming in hot with <laughs> Ukrite. So yes, uh, Yang Chen Chung of SR Meteorites, um, he also had a Ukrite. And um, for this one, he um, has two videos that he sent to us. So this Ukrite um, was classified by uh, Dr. Anthony Love at Appalachian State University. Looks like some nice uh, fusion crust there. Yeah. Wow, look at how thick it is up in the corner. Wow. Does this make you miss your gurara? <laughs> no, not even. But... <laughs> wow. He has a good eye. He. he... Wow. That is gorgeous. Yeah, it looks like a nice hunk of ham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see here. So Topher, do you mind if I say something real quick? Go right ahead, man. Okay, so like we were talking about how my polymic Ukrate looked like right on the edge of what you would get between a Ukrate and a Howardite. To me, this looks right on the edge of what you would get between a Ukrate and a Diagenet. Ex yep. Yeah. Wow. Is this the same video or is this the second one? That, that was the the same one. This is the okay. second one now. Hmm. I've never had the chance to work with Dr. Love. He's he's definitely busy. <laughs> Ooh, that's polished up wow. really nicely. Someone Super shiny. <laughs> It's a nice stone. And uh, I'm not sure if you're going to see a whole lot of that out. He may he may just keep that hole. <laughs> I don't know what his plans are. I don't know. He... He's cutting that other one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, Yang is crazy. Awesome. Well, congrats, buddy. Thank you. Now, unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, I don't think that we were able to have Craig and Zach uh, log in with us tonight, which is too bad because we have a lot of classifications and Zach was a little camera shy. So Craig was going to talk about his classification, but we want to congratulate Zach Zlyman on his first ever approved classification in the Met Bowl. Here we go. So congratulations. Nice. Woo! <laughs> nice. Um, I did read in the Met Bowl that his dad bought it for him and gifted it to him for the classification. So that was really nice of Craig. So um, we can look at these pictures. So it's a Ukrite polymict found in Northwest Africa in 2022. So classified by um, Dr. Melinda Hudson, who we had on uh, a few months ago, and her husband, yep. Dr. Alex Ruzica <laughs> of Cascadia Meteorite Lab, the dynamic duo. I um, talked about this with Craig, but I was really counting on him to be able to talk about these. <laughs> so look at the eye candy. Um, there's, yeah, there's one more picture like this. So, um, and then the rest of them are of the meteorite itself. So exciting for Zach. Wow. And if, as I was like doing this presentation, I thought maybe I need a breakdown and finally get a classification myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, because wow. I was so excited for him. And I'm like, this is exciting. Maybe I need to do it. 
Topher still hasn't got me my witness lunar classification I'm yet. I'm <laughs> wow, that is this is super interesting. Congrats, uh, Zach. And yeah, yeah, hopefully I'll have a conversation with you guys and find out a little bit more interesting fact about because I'm looking at this and I'm seeing that a nodule's being pointed out or some some inclusions being pointed out. This looks really eucritic to me right here, but then you have large grains that I don't think are eucritic. So yeah, lots to get into on that one. Um, all right, so we're going to jump into the lunar and Martian uh, classification. So as you can see, I've, on, on these screens, I've been bolding the um, the rare classifications, usually like anything under, you know, 30. Um, and we've been seeing a lot of rare lunar classifications lately. Um, so, but before we jump into the lunars, let's go over the one um, Martian shergatite um, that I'm featuring. And that is um, Sean Mahoney of Outer Space or Meteorites. Our buddy that just stayed with us a few weeks ago, he had Martian Shergatite uh, classified. Um, so this one is, I believe it's called Smera 003. And so there was a lot of buzz about this one in Tucson. So um, the pictures that you're going to see on the next few slides were taken by crew member Scott McGregor. So um, he was actually really instrumental in providing all the information that I'm presenting during the show and tell. So um, that's, you know, just a picture of the slice. On the next few slides, um, you're going to see these really bright cream colored um, inclusions. And so these are um, 30 times magnified and um, talking with different people at the Tucson rock show, Scott said he heard a few different theories. One that these inclusions were due to terrestrial mineral, mineral deposits. Um, and another uh, was that maybe it was formed on Mars. And the other theory was that it was formed on the way from Mars to earth. So um, he also wondered if these spots might be fluorescent and uh, with the help of a um, one of the flashlight, the 30, 365, um, um, he found nanometer. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Um, he found that they are indeed um, and very brightly. So, um, so um, this video is only a few seconds long. So you might want to just play it a few times oh, while I talk about it, Topher. Um, so he said, you know, to his surprise, when he moved the UV flashlight away from the slice, the spots continue to glow for just a little bit still. And they're also phosphorescent. So he said several people in Tucson observed the inclusions, um, that the inclusions were present in melt pockets um, with a reasonably intact uh, stone. So that it reduced the likelihood of terrestrial water and mineral uh, intrusion. Yeah. Others said that they um, looked like terrestrial deposits and um, other more weathered meteorites. Um, and so that was a like, likely explanation. So um, Carla G, who did the original classification, was kind enough to take another look at it and felt that it was indeed in, um, terrestrial um, minerals that had filled the bugs and the vesicles. Um, and so that's probably the answer. So they're going to be doing some further lab studies. Uh, they're in progress um, by an advocate of a um, of the non-terrestrial theory. So there's gonna be additional data coming out soon. Um, and then Sean had shared with um, Scott, who made sure to share with me, that um, he that uh, Sean sent another slice of this to a scientist um, in Zurich who is doing further analysis on the um, phosphorescent inclusions, and he wants to see if he can make it a, a case for whether it's terrestrial or if it's Martian. So um, lastly, Scott told me he's been on the search for a really beautiful Martian. He said lunars are always really beautiful, but he doesn't feel that's the case of Martians as much. So he says that in his beauty contest, um, the terrestrialization, um, you know, the terrestrial mineralization, he feels is disqualifying Smira from his beauty contest. But he does like this spotted sugar tight and um, with the filled bugs and vesicles, um, it's certainly a candidate for being the most interesting, if not the most pretty. Yeah, I was checking that stuff out in Tucson. It's pretty weird. Yeah. So our, um, jumping into the lunar classifications, we had a NWA-16372, a lunar tractolytic north site. Um, Mark Lyon and Jason Bliss are the main mass holders. And um, I think we have a picture or, no, we have, oh yeah, just one picture of this one. So this one was uh, classified by Carla G. And yeah, it looks really cool. Topher, anything that you want to mention about this one? 
I see uh, the this these crystals in here of interest, as well as some holes, some uh, that's a lunar. Wow, yeah, it's beautiful. If you look at this gray color that you see here, this grayish green, very troctolitic color. Yeah, really cool stuff. And I, I didn't have it on the screen, but um, like I did have Carla G was as the um, classifier and uh, he works out of uh, the Institute of Meteoritics at the University of New Mexico. So our next uh, lunar is uh, a Gerard 013. Um, Marcin Samala is the main mass holder, but we have um, uh, two of our uh, crew members, Mark Lyon and Craig Lyman as specimen holders. And um, this, I think we have a few pictures of this one. This was another Craig show and tell, <laughs> but this one uh, was a picture taken by Mark at the, um, the 2024 Tempe or Tempe, the 2024 Tucson rock show. <laughs> and then the rest of the pictures were taken by Craig. It is, it looks so delicate. Look, it's going to break in half. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, there is one thing that's super cool about this that I know. I don't know how many people else know, but see these white stones? Check this out. They're translucent. That's cool. Yeah. A lunar melt breccia with translucency. Yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah. And this Thanks for the pictures, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of lunars, we're still kind of looking at lunars. Um, and some of you probably saw this on Facebook. Congratulations to Daniel Shake on the 300 uh, classification milestone, which is amazing. Oh, nice. And he's he's becoming the next Randy, Dr. Randy Kortev. Um, he is the lunar guy. Um, so yeah, let's take a look on the next screen. These are Daniel's um, classifications in 2024 so far which is really impressive. And the year just, just started. I know, it just started. And he's had more classified since I created this presentation. Wow. So I just wanted to mention that he can't be here tonight. Um, he is working on a presentation. He was going to make a video. He knew he wasn't going to be able to be here, but um, he and George, I mean, um, are are working diligently. They have about eight hours left to the deadline uh, to get their presentations ready um, for the uh, Lunar and Planetary Conference next week. So George has a poster presentation on a Martian shergatite, and um, Daniel is doing a talk on his newest lunar classification. So let's wish them good luck. Um, obviously, I don't think this video will be out in time, so um, drop him a message on Facebook and, and wish them luck, good luck, and hopefully they'll do well at the conference. And just since we were talking about Daniel, I figured we would show one of his lunar classifications since we were looking at um, lunars classified by other scientists. So this one is um, Matt Stream as the main mass holder. I just have one picture of it but it looks really nice. It's uh, NWA 16349. And it's a uh, pretty stuff. It's a yeah. basaltic gabbro brescia. Wow. There's only 50, 50 grams, I think. <laughs> and you oh can't have any. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Now we're going into chondrites. We're moving along. All right. So first we're going to go over carbonaceous chondrites. And um, we have the numbers here. Um, there aren't too many rare ones at the C2 ungrouped, kind of the C3 ungrouped is kind of rare too. Um, and uh, for our crew member, we have Yang who has another CM2. I think he had one on the last Metbull update as well. Um, so the total known weight of this one's 101 grams. And um, we'll take a look at the pictures. Um, this one was classified by Angsgar Grishaki. Um, I hope I'm saying his name correctly. I'm trying my best. <laughs> Sounds right to me. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I would like to say that, you know, Yang specializes in one thing, but he dips his toe in every pond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Carbonaceous, irons, or, in, or yeah. Eucrites. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Palisades, irons. All right. So ordinary Eucrites, we have a little bit more representation in the ordinary uh, chondrites. So, our first one is, this is the miscellaneous ones, you know, the ordinaries and the ungrouped chondrites and the rumorudis. So um, Yang was coming in hot. He had, of the three rumorudis, two of those are his. 
So we're going to take a look at his first room of Rudy, which is NWA 16335. And this is an R3. We'll get a few pictures of these ones. Oh, that's beautiful. Classified by Dr. Anthony Love of Appalachian State University again. Wow. Yeah, rumor Rudy's are always uh, breccias. So it doesn't surprise me that there's a lot of stuff going on in there, but that's super interesting right there. Yeah. Wow. So I... I was, uh, we just sold a room of Rudy the other day and I told Topher, I'm like, I don't think we have any other room of Rudy's in our inventory. Why don't I see these very often? And I'm like, what makes a room of Rudy a room of Rudy? So I, of course, looked it up and he's like, well, you need to go back and watch the room of Rudy video that we did <laughs> during the one-on-one series. And I'm like, I will do that. I don't have time right now, but I'm going to. But um, the room of Rudy group, and it was kind of good that I put it in with these um, miscellaneous ones because the way it's described in the Met Bull is that room of Rudy's do not clearly belong to any of the major um, classes of chondrites, which are the ordinary the carbonaceous, the ensotite, they don't really fit in anywhere. Um, our chondrites have a subsolar um, magnesium uh, silicon um, and refractory silicon ratios, oxygen isotope um, compositions that plot above the terrestrial fractional uh, fractionization fractionation line and ordinary chondrites and highly oxidized mineralogy. So sorry, that was a mouthful, mouthful but they're very different from um, the rest of the ordinary chondrites. That's basically the takeaway that I got. But these are these are gorgeous. Yeah, they're very beautiful. And I think we even have a video. Yes, this is oh, the this of is... his of this of his second um of his R three five. That's big. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh we should have muted it. <laughs> nice. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Yang. Appreciate it. Yeah, who would have thought it was going to be that beautiful on the inside? Would no, I know? That's awesome. All right, so now we're going to move on to the H chondrites. We have a few. Um, we have the H three melt brushes, the only really rare one there. Um, but we do have um, Smiley coming in with his H four chondrite classification. Um, NWA one six five zero five found in Morocco in two thousand seventeen. Um, Yes, Smiley. Um, I don't think he's here tonight, um, but we have a few pictures and then we have a video from Smiley. And I, oh, wow, I, that looks familiar. <laughs> Should be familiar. Hey everyone, it's Smiley here. I've uh, been off the radar for a little bit, uh, tied up with work, but I wanted to share with you all uh, my latest uh, exciting uh, classification. It is NWA16505. It was a uh, 2017 find in Morocco, and it has been officially classified as an H4, uh, comprised of uh, two stones, one 710 and one, hundred, uh, one 850 grams for a total of... Uh, 1,560 grams. I purchased this back in 2022 from uh, Topher and Sue and had uh, Chris Monk slice and dice the, the one up here. Nice. And I sent it to Daniel Shake for uh, classification. And yeah, it is a beauty. Uh, my other one was an L, but this one got to be an H. So I am excited. Ooh. Just gonna show <laughs> some of the, the metal blebbing and some of the chondrules and whatnot in, in some of these slices, but it's definitely a, a, a cool meteorite. So thank you very much again, uh, Topher and Sue, and Daniel for uh, classifying, and Chris for slicing and dicing. If you need uh, a good uh, meteorite cutter, Chris is definitely your man. Okay, talk to you later, guys. Bye. Nice. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, Chris congratulations, rocks. Smiley. All right, so... Um, here are the L's, so that was an H. So here are the L classifications. And as you can see, we have some rare ones on there. Um, we have um, the uh, L3.15, the 3.10, 
the one I'm featuring is not one of the rare ones. Um, I'm featuring an L5 chondrite. Now, I don't have any pictures of it, but um, the person that had it classified was Mike Kelly. And so I asked him to make a video and he's like, I'll do one better. I'll try to join you. And I, I told him, well, I don't know what's going to happen. So make a video just to be safe. But so we had him join us and we have a video from him. So we've all been missing him, something terrible. So it's really good to have uh, been able to see him tonight and then now have this little message from him. Hey, Bolloy Crook, Mike, checking in from the desert. I uh, just wanted to let you guys know that I'm doing good. Hopefully you're doing good too. Definitely missing the, uh, the Wednesday hangouts. So it's always been a highlight of my week. So looking forward to that when I get back. Uh, hopefully y'all's collections are growing nicely and uh, it looked like Tucson was a lot of fun. Try to keep track with the highlights. Uh, watched a couple of Tucson videos and really, uh, really made me happy to see that a lot of y'all made it out there and it was a, was a good time and looked like it was a successful Tucson for everybody and a great meteorite mansion. So uh, yeah, just checking in and uh, you know, I'm gonna stay safe here and get on home and uh, get back to uh, doing the weekly hangouts and uh, hopefully uh, y'all doing great over there. Stay safe and uh, keep growing those collections. Nice. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we miss you, bud. Yes, we do. Can't wait to have him back doing the one on ones. It's just not the same without Mike. All right, so Absolutely. I'm going to feature another L, um, and it's Jason Whitcomb's L, and it's another L5. Uh, so um, what Jason shared with me is that um, while it seems like this is just another ordinary L5, the um, light color band you can move to the images uh, seen in these images and is actually an area of melt. And what makes it different, according to um, Dr. Hurd, is the low sulfide content, which is um, especially responsible for darkening. So not something that um, is seen, these light bands of melt, is they're not usually seen in just ordinary chondrites very often. Hmm. So this was classified by um, Chris Hurd and um, Dr. Poon uh, from University of Alberta. And it has, there's about uh, 1.3 kilograms available. Beautiful crusted one too. Oh, look at the size of these chondrules sticking out right here. Big. Wow. Nice. Yeah, like 3D chondrules. That's beautiful. So this is what you're talking about, this two, the two different colors here? This is melted? Yeah, the white band that, yeah, is going through. Oh, very interesting. <clears throat> So thank you to to Jason for all. He's very diligent and really detailed with everything that he provides to me. I'm hoping we can get him past his uh, shyness in front of the camera and get him uh, showing doing his show and tell on camera someday. <laughs> I'm working on him. <laughs> wow, that is that's amazing right there. I think that that should be on a wall. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, All right, and now we're going to kick it back to Monk Man to talk about his L3 and show off some pictures. We talked a little bit earlier about um, Daniel having three his 300th classification. Ironically, this stone right here, NWA 16506, I believe, and somebody's going to have to disprove it, that was his actual 300th classification. Nice. Awesome. So... <laughs> so this one was a single stone, a uh, total weight of 589 grams. And as Pat is in a pursuit of a low sub or low petrological grade um, chondrites in the, in the L3.XX, I also am fascinated my specialty or not specialty, but what I'm interested in in, in its L3s LL3s and carbonaceous, those um, low petrological grades. So in the pursuit of that, I ran across this. And if you look at a lot of my classifications that are ordinary chondrites, it was me picking them from pictures and trying to score the, the, the type threes. This was one of them that actually came back as L3 and uh, just really cool stone. Uh, no fusion crust, a little bit of weathering, but just lots of chondrules. Because um, it was a single stone, so he got a couple of slices and a part slice for the thin section. 
Um, just a really cool pack yeah. full of chondral stone. Wow. That's great, man. Congrats. Next Met Bull update. I'll have a couple of more. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well done. All right. Now we're moving to LLs. And as you can see, we had some rare classifications at the LLs, all the ones that are in bold. And um, we have um, two different crew members who had LLs. Um, obviously, Craig is not with us right now, but he had an LL 3.3 uh, classified, um, and we can look at the pictures um, that he provided. Um, well, this is the one that uh, was from the Met Bull, um, provided by uh, Dr. Hudson and uh, Dr. Alex Rezica. Um, and then these pictures were there are two of them that were uh, provided by Craig himself. Um, so cool looking meteorite. Um, I thought that last picture That's was crazy. really cool looking. <laughs> yeah. I'd have to read the write-up on it, like the dual litho or weathering. I'm always curious. Yeah, and I'm sorry I didn't get more details. I was leaving oh. that to Craig to talk about. <laughs> but really cool stuff to at least take a look at. So now we're going to kick it over to Pat, who had um, his his uh, L. Was it an LL or an L? I hope I didn't get them backwards. It's an L, so I'm sorry. We should have done this in the last section. But... It's really cool nonetheless. Um, so we're going to kick it over to Pat. Hi, guys. Uh, I finally made it to the bottom rung of the 3.XX ladder with this L3.15. Um, uh, to get the low subtypes, there's a bunch of extra work uh, that's done with measurements uh, of chromium oxide in the ferroin olivine. And uh, here's a, uh, the, the first uh, family photo of them. This is the, uh, the stone that I cut, uh, believe it or not, the ugliest of the, of the four. And a number of slices taken. And you can see the really prominent white chondrules. And here's the rest of the family. The, uh, the one on the far left, I keep on top of my desk all the time. <laughs> and this one, has some very interesting uh, carbonaceous looking inclusions that Daniel described as CM2 looking. And one of the uh, professors in France, Dr. G Dr. Gatasica, is searching out uh, carbonaceous inclusions in type threes for a study. So there'll be a slice of this on the way to him. And I hope this is just the first of my 3.XX ordinary chondrites. Thank you, guys. Awesome, man. Thank you. And congrats. Yeah, yeah congratulations, congratulations, Pat. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is a milestone for you. So, yes, yes I'm excited for you. <laughs> All right. Last section, we're moving on to the irons and stony irons. So there's going to be irons, palisites, and mesosiderites. Um, so we have um, a, a mesosiderite A3 is probably the most rare of those that was uh, that were classified, and the one I'm featuring though is a palisite um, for Craig. And um, when he was working to get me the pictures, I told him, "Don't worry about it. We have plenty of pictures of that because we loved that meteorite. We got some of it ourselves." So um, Ian and Topher took pictures of this beautiful palisite. And um, this this small piece had a really, um, I think, high concentration of metal. The other one doesn't have as much metal, but um, Topher, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I just, I thought that the pattern was striking on it. Um, look at that. Yeah. When you catch it at the right angle, it really shows the, the separation of the banding on it. And uh, yeah, so then I just, I think, no, I didn't sell this. We think we still have this one. We did. No, we sold the small one just oh, last week. No, this we have was, this. We have this. We have one this. Still. One. So this is the end cut of it, and yeah, it is absolutely gorgeous. But again, you see a really, really striking uh, difference in the coloration of this uh, of the metal in it. Just a beautiful meteorite. And there's the external side of it with some olivine poking out. Oh, yeah. that's gorgeous. It's. I love the shape of the olivines in it. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. 
All right, so that brings us to the end. And so I just, in the next few slides, I just wanted to point out um, if you wanted to go back and catch some of the past MEPL updates, um, I, I included some of the title screens so you know what to search for. Um, this last, um, the 992 was the last one I did, and that was um, summarizing the, the um, last, I think, five months of 2023. Um, on the next slide, um, that was just another one where we covered a lot of meteorites, obviously twice as many as we covered in this one. And there were a few parts to that one. <laughs> obviously we couldn't do a three or four hour <laughs> update. Um, this one was um, part three of that same series. Uh, and Pat and I talked about Antarctica a lot in this one. Um, I think that's a subject that we're both fascinated by and he knows a lot more about it than I do, but I'm definitely interested. And this one was one of my first, um, really, you know, um, I think more upscale updates um, and Topher did a really good, great job editing and getting lots of um, planetary videos and pictures in there. So if you want to um, go back and catch some of those past ones, you can search for those um, on YouTube on our channel. And lastly, just want to thank you all for your time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And um, also just wanted to say that um, if there's anything you want to see more of or less of or um, something that you would like me to feature that I haven't done yet, um, uh, you know, a new an aspect of newly published uh, meteorites, um, definitely let me know. I'm open to all constructive and respectful feedback, <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, again, thank you very much. Have a great one. Bye. Well, thank you very much. So you did a great job on that. Um, I, I'm actually looking forward to these uh, MEPL updates now because it's less work for me. All I have to do is edit it. So uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate all the personal, well, just the, the extra stories uh, behind the scenes of these meteorites. And uh, next week, it, or next time we can get Craig's Lyman to actually access technology correctly, we can include him as well. Thanks a lot. And have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye. Dr. Allen, Dr. Allen, Dr. Allen uh, Rezica of Alex? Cascadia. Alex, that's yep. what I said, wasn't it? Nope. Allen. Oh.